everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Chris Ciccarino. I'm a postdoc in uh, Felipe Jornada's group at Stanford. You might have to stand oh, a little closer. Yeah, sure. fine. Yeah, so I'm excited to tell you about uh, some work we've been doing looking at strong coupling of excitons and photons using ab initio calculations. I want to start with a high level uh, motivation for this work. And the highest level we can think of is this basic phenomena of having some material and shining light on it. Uh, this might seem simple uh, when we just use these, these words as, as we're doing right now, but uh, the interactions of light with matter is very important for a number of applications. And um, some of these include optoelectronic devices like solar cells and lasers. Uh, light can alter chemical landscapes. Uh, using things like photocatalysis. Um, light and matter interactions have also more recently been interesting for maybe quantum communication. And if these two entities couple strongly, you can have hybridization of light and matter leading to polaritons. And as often is the case for materials with a band gap, the interaction of light and matter can introduce what are known as excitons. And so if we want to understand optical properties well, we often need to understand and characterize excitons well. So let's quickly review a very simple picture of what an exciton is. Let's say we have a two band system as shown below, and we have a single electron residing uh, in the valence band. If we go ahead and shine light on the system, uh, if this light has enough energy, the electron can be promoted to the conduction band, leaving behind a hole in the valence band or the absence of an electron. And we know from regular electrostatics, you have a positive charge and a negative charge. They tend to attract each other. And so this electron hole pair can form a bound state known as an exciton. This is a very simple picture. And unfortunately, nature is a bit more messy. But all we want to learn from this slide is that excitons come about from interactions among electron hole pairs. So we want to get excitons to describe optical properties. We want to use electron hole pairs and their interactions to get excitons. So uh, as I said, it's a little bit more uh, complicated than just a simple two band model. We often need many bands and we need to discretize our, uh, our reciprocal lattice uh, using these dots here as a schematic. So we have to include many uh, bands and many wave vectors interacting uh, together in these electron hole pairs. We can go ahead and cast the exciton problem as an eigenvalue equation. We have some Hamiltonian H, uh, which is known as the beta Salpeter equation Hamiltonian. If we diagonalize this Hamiltonian, uh, we get our exciton energies as the eigenvalues and our exciton states uh, as the eigenfunctions. And this Hamiltonian is a dense matrix uh, can introduce or, or made up of interactions among all of our electron hole pairs in our system. And in order to describe the excitons well, we typically need to uh, construct the matrix that is sufficiently large to capture all the relevant interactions. And this can be on the order of maybe 10,000 up to 500,000 uh, in, in rank. So uh, already we're seeing this is quite a computational uh, effort to diagonalize. One of the uh, fundamental parts of uh, this matrix are the interactions among electron hole pairs. And one of the approximations that is made to make this problem easier is the instantaneous approximation. So we have on the screen now two electron hole pairs. We know we want to capture their interaction. And the instantaneous approximation says we can basically uh, think of their interaction as instantaneous. There's no uh, time in, in which the electron hole pair on the left needs to communicate with the electron hole pair on the right. It happens instantaneously. So if we go ahead and write our uh, interaction, and I, I apologize, I guess part of this got cut off. Uh, the interaction meeting this uh, interaction is just a Coulomb interaction, which in reciprocal space goes as 1 over Q squared. So we, need, we typically assume these interactions occur instantaneously, and this makes the calculations much more tractable. In this work, we're going to introduce a bit of a more rigorous approach. And in this uh, situation, we're not going to assume this interaction occurs instantaneously but it's mediated by some photon that's carrying uh, this interaction uh, with us. So um, now our interaction kernel is much more complicated, and we see we have to use relativistic terms 
including the current four vector, uh, the photon propagator, uh, and, and another current four vector. And it also depends on the wave vector and the frequency of our uh, photon mediating the interaction. So this more rigorous treatment also means the calculation is uh, more challenging. Before we go any further, I just want to introduce these simple motifs to delineate the static exciton, which uses the instantaneous approximation, and what we're calling an exciton polariton, which is now including this relativistic photon coupling. OK, so how do we go about calculations of this more complicated system? Uh, we're going to start with the idea that any peaks in our spectral function A as a function of, of Q and omega come about um, uh, or represent long-lived solutions to our exciton polariton system. And we can write the spectral function as the imaginary trace of this matrix L. L is known as the correlation function. And this matrix uh, depends on this wave vector and frequency uh, since we're including these relativistic effects. We can write an equation for L inverse, uh, which involves that beta cell Peter Hamiltonian I showed earlier, and the interaction kernel uh, related to the non-instantaneous approximation. So we can easily construct L inverse, and then the challenge is inverting this giant matrix to get L and then taking the trace. And as I said, this has a Q and omega dependence. So if we want to get a dispersion relation, we want to look at the energy as a function of wave vector. We need to uh, invert this matrix for unique wave vectors and frequency values. So we might need on the order of a million points in this two-dimensional space, which means we have to invert a million matrices uh, that are already quite large. So uh, how do we go about doing this computationally? We're going to leverage uh, computational resources uh, to, to do all of this work. And we're going to start with Berkeley GW, which is a GPU accelerated and very uh, scalable high performance code that will give us the ingredients we need to construct L inverse. Once we construct L inverse, we're going to use, again, GPU accelerated codes to invert this matrix and then take the trace to get our spectral uh, function. And uh, we're already nine slides in, and I haven't showed any results yet, and you might be getting hungry and wondering if this is going to be a prolonged talk that wasn't supposed to be. But I promise um, we're getting to the results very soon. But before we show any results, let's get a very basic understanding of what we might expect to see from these calculations. So I'm going to introduce a very uh, crude drawing of what we might expect the dispersion to look like. So as a function of, of wave vector and energy, uh, we see these two polaritonic branches that diverge uh, asymptotically near the light cone, near where uh, basically the light dispersion exists. And this is for a simple two-band model, uh, and we were going to go ahead and do this using ab initio calculations. So let's get to some results. The first plot here on the left are uh, dispersion results for magnesium oxide, which is, which is just the material we chose to use. It's a wide band gap material. And we're looking at this dispersion, and you might think it looks kind of boring, because nothing has dispersion as a function of Q. All of these lines are completely flat. And that's because we're relying on this instantaneous approximation. If we go ahead and uh, include these relativistic effects, we get something much more rich and interesting which is the exciton polariton uh, spectral function on the right, where we do see features we thought we might see on the previous slide. We have this lower polariton branch that is diverging near the light cone at this low energy, but we also are, are able to capture more rich uh, physics at higher bands because we're including all of these in our calculations. The near vertical line, is that your light cone? Yes, yeah, sorry, the, okay. the vertical line is the light cone. It's not quite vertical. Not quite. No, it has a slope, finite slope, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so we see here that fundamentally the dispersion of our exciton, one of its core uh, properties, is greatly affected by this relativistic coupling. And uh, any of these behaviors that emerge from excitons related to optical properties are, are likely to change as well. Another. Uh, 
uh, fundamental property of excitons are their wave functions. So we're able to capture the wave functions and how they evolve as a function of introducing this coupling. So uh, what we're plotting is the electron part of our two particle wave function. Remember, we have an electron in a hole. We're fixing the hole at this coordinate plus, which you uh, hopefully can see on these plots and looking at how the electron wave function uh, looks. Uh, and you can see that it basically looks like an, uh, an S orbital around the whole position. And when we include polaritonic effects on the right, we see that this wave function becomes much more localized in real space. And this is a sign that our exciton polariton is introducing this attractive interaction. And as a result, our wave functions are collapsing in real space. So again, we see that a fundamental property of our exciton being its wave function is uh, drastically changed when we introduce uh, this relativistic coupling. So, uh, so far we've seen that introducing this photon is critical to the properties of these exciton polariton systems. And we also see that it, it likely has a lot to do with the nature of the photon itself. So we're really excited to think of uh, ways in which we can tune the photon and luckily, there are a lot of uh, efforts doing this already, um, using things like metasurfaces, cavities, or encapsulation. Uh, by tuning the photon, we expect that this can indirectly tune the exciton system and allow us to uh, dictate behavior we might be interested in, in realizing in these exciton polariton systems. So uh, just to conclude here, uh, we've been able to explicitly include photons in exciton calculations using ab initio techniques and high performance computational codes. Uh, results show that exciton polariton states have unique dispersion properties and spatial localization of their wave functions. All of this work is afforded by uh, GPU scalability and in inverting this one million, these one million matrices. So far, we've been able to invert them up to size maybe 15,000 or 20,000 thereabouts. But we'd really like to push the boundaries on this and go to maybe a multi-GPU distributed matrix that would be able to uh, use many GPUs and therefore give us the capacity to invert larger matrices. Before I finish, I want to thank the people that worked on me with this, uh, including my advisor, Professor Felipe Giornata, and of course, the resources at NERSC for allowing us to carry out this work. And I'm happy to take any questions. Sure, sure. So you're using one GPU for these inversions? Yeah, so we're, we're each uh, wave vector and frequency we're giving to a different GPU, okay. and they're doing them, uh, you know, in parallel, but on different to each core, to to each GPU, yeah. And these are dense matrices, or yes, yes. Sorry, you said that the, so how long does it take to invert one one matrix? Maybe you said it, but I didn't. No, yeah, it's on the order of those seconds or tens of seconds. But you have a lot of them now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Million. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> Thank you so much.